Cornell Mars rover, known as CMR, is in its fifth year of existence with 40 members. These 40 members are broken up into six subteams. Drive, which deals with the drivetrain. Tasks, which designs the robotic arm and drill. Electrical, which designs the wiring and circuitry. Control software, which deals with the control programming of the rover. Science, which determines the sensors and tests to conduct. And business, which deals with outreach and funding. These teams are focused on design during the fall semester of the year. As we transition to the spring, we redistribute into testing teams that are specifically focused on each competition task. These teams are named after their respective tasks. The subteams and testing teams are overseen by the systems engineer and the project manager. The project manager serves as overall oversight for the team, dealing with deadlines, paperwork, and funding. The systems engineer deals with interdisciplinary communication and ensuring that all the subsystems can work together. In terms of the overall management outside of Cornell Mars Rover, CMR is part of a broader engineering project team program at Cornell. This is overseen by Rebecca McDonald, who serves as the Swanson Director of Project Teams. Most of the resources for the project teams are from the mechanical and electrical departments of Cornell. The technical advisor specific to Cornell Mars Rover is Carl Poitras, who is an Electrical and Computing Engineering Department lecturer. For URC, our rover needs to be able to handle a series of design constraints that are consistent across all competition tasks. In order to regulate system mass, we created a Google spreadsheet that allowed all team members to record the, the mass of their individual components and then tally them based on the tasks they would be used in to make sure the rover remained under the 50 kilogram mass limit for each individual task, as well as the 70 kilogram overall mass limit. A 10% contingency was implemented in the spreadsheet to handle any irregularities that might arise towards the end of the year. We also ensured we were under the monetary budget by recording the costs that components would actually contribute toward the rover's budget when they are ordered. This budget is maintained throughout the year by our business team. In order for our rover to last the possible 30 to 60 minute duration of our tasks, we have one 22 amp hour MaxAmp LiPo battery on board the rover. The battery has a 40C discharge rate and weighs only 2.5 kilograms. The high capacity allows us to have ample supply for all of our components beyond the required one hour, while the high discharge rate makes our power systems resistant to any current spikes that might be experienced during any task. During competition, we transmit commands from our base station over a 2.4 GHz communication system that uses two Rocket M2 Ubiquiti transceivers. At the base station, we have a dual polarized 16 dBi, 120 degree sector antenna that transmits to two 12 dBi omnidirectional antennas that are on the rover. This system is used for all communication with the rover, including commands and camera streams. We have four USB-based Logitech webcams that constantly transmit footage from the rover back to our base station. 3D printed camera mounts allow us to change the location of these cameras for each task. For instance, during arm-based tasks, we have a camera at the end of our end effector in order to give our arm driver the best vantage point to see what they are trying to grasp. While for terrain traversal, we have a mount on the side of our rover that allows our cameras to see the rover suspension system and best allow our driver to overcome obstacles such as the rock garden. A USB GPS provides locational information to our rover, which is displayed on a GUI visible to our drivers, allowing us to map our rover location and also the GPS coordinates of tools for astronaut assistance as well as drill sites for science cache. Commands from the base station are transmitted to the Intel NUC, our onboard computer. From here, signals are transmitted over an I2C bus to four PIC32 microcontrollers. These microcontrollers generate the necessary PWM and direction signals that interface with our H-Bridge motor drivers to control our drive and tasks-based motors. The microcontrollers also receive various sensor data, such as encoder readings to regulate PID control and pH and humidity sensor readings for our science-based tasks, which are relayed back to the NUC via our I2C bus. This year's rover's design was optimized for terrain traversal. Our rover has six independent spring-loaded suspensions with linkages acting as the primary structural supports. Our linkages do not bow out like standard suspension systems, but rather bow forwards and backwards. The spring dampening of the suspension is designed to allow smooth driving over rough terrain. 
The suspension system elevates the main body of the rover 16 inches above the ground and grants full clearance below the frame. This year's wheels were also optimized to grant the rover clearance under the frame while driving. The wheels boast embedded motors, an 8 inch diameter, and a 6.2 inch length. They are lined with rough top rubber tread to increase friction and surface area contact with the train for successful driving. Each wheel is equipped with independently controlled motors that supply about 24 newton meters of peak torque and 12 newton meters of continuous torque. This year, we use optical encoders to integrate PID control for each motor. This allows us better motor control during competition, especially for the train traversal task. Finally, our electronic score is manufactured by Protocase and boasts a foam spring dampening system to protect the rover's hardware. The E-Core holds the electronic components in a flat, one-layered structure. The cooling fans and battery enclosure are integrated into the shape of the case. The robotic arm has seven degrees of freedom. A base joint, a shoulder joint, an elbow joint, wrist tilt and wrist rotation, an end effector open and close, and an unscrewing, screwing in belt system. The base joint allows for 360 degrees of rotation, allowing the arm to reach in front of the rover to pick up tools and then rotate 180 degrees to drop the tool off in a storage bin in the back of the rover. The base joint uses a keyless bushing to transfer rotational motion from the motor shaft to a set of worm gears, which the rest of the arm sits on. This configuration allows the base to hold its position very effectively while the rover is driving over rough terrain. The shoulder and elbow joints both have a similar design, with the motor shaft connected to a set of worm gears which the joint's linkage is mounted to. The worm gears prevent these joints from being back driven, and combined with the strength of these joints components, allows the rover to drive while holding 5 kilograms of weight in the arm during the astronaut assistance task. ANSYS simulations were carried out for each joint of the arm. These ANSYS simulations show results dealing with the shoulder worm gear and elbow linkage shaft. The results of all of the analyses prove that all of the arm components are strong enough to hold up to 5 kilograms of weight. The wrist joint utilizes a differential gear design, which allows the joint to perform both tilting and rotation. Two sets of motors, worm gears, and bevel gears drive this joint. When the bevel gears are spun in the same direction, the wrist tilts, and when the bevel gears are spun in opposite directions, the wrist rotates. Having this design allows us to save space by combining two joints into one. This also lowers the overall mass of the arm. The wrist also has a robust design so that during the equipment servicing task, the gasoline can be poured out by simply rotating the wrist joint. With the fingers of the end effector in the closed position, the wrist can also be used to flip switches and open a fuel cap. The end effector has two worm gears driven by the same worm, allowing the fingers to open and close simultaneously. The worm prevents the joint from being back driven, allowing the arm to grip a 5 kg weight in the end effector firmly. A 4 bar linkage is utilized to have the fingers open and close with as little forward motion as possible. This makes operating the arm much simpler since the arm operator does not need to consider any forward movement of the end effector when attempting to pick up objects. The fingers of the end effector interlock with one another and have a V-shaped cutout, allowing the arm to get a secure grasp on a variety of objects. A carabiner attachment will also be utilized by the end effector, making holding and attaching the carabiner to the wagon easier for the arm operator during the equipment servicing task. Once the wagon is transported, a rope release mechanism will release the wagon from the rover so that it is not pulled around during the remainder of the competition. The screwing and unscrewing of the regulator during the equipment servicing task is performed by a set of belts on the inside of each end effector finger. The belts are driven in opposite directions, depending on whether an object needs to be screwed in or unscrewed. This design prevents the arm operator from having to perform a ratcheting motion with the arm which is a very complex set of movements of multiple arm joints at once. Three cameras are designated to help the arm operator perform tasks. During the astronaut assistance task, one camera is placed on the end effector and two cameras are placed on the front of the frame of the rover, pointing at different locations on the ground. The drive camera is also utilized in this task to aid in storing items in the bin in the back of the rover. During the equipment servicing task, the end effector and one frame camera are still utilized, while the third camera is put off to the side of the rover. This third camera allows the arm operator to see the arm from a side view, allowing the arm operator to gauge distance to any panels or objects, such as the wagon or fuel cap. 
We use an auger drill bit design that is based on an Archimedes screw in order to collect soil into a sample box. A rack and pinion system drives the drill bit further into the ground while the drill bit is spinning, pushing soil up the auger. The sample box collects the soil at ground level for each individual sample. A false bottom in this box then allows us to drop the sample into a rotating sample box system which can collect up to three distinct samples from different sites. Inside of these boxes, we have mounted a pH sensor in one and a humidity sensor in another box. Once a hole is drilled, a pulley system drops an infrared temperature sensor into the hole to get our subsurface temperature reading. In addition, this year we're experimenting with a new humidity sensor developed in conjunction with a professor here at Cornell that will be mounted on our auger bit. This capacitive humidity sensor measures the dielectric of the soil that is around the sensor while the drill is in the ground. This measurement will change based on the humidity in the soil, allowing us to measure the soil's humidity while it's in the ground. With our lab tests, we aim to find evidence for water and measure soil nutrient levels. We deploy an advanced moisture sensor that is much more sensitive than the onboard variant in order to detect trace amounts of water. We will also look for indirect evidence of water by testing for carbonate, which forms in water or as a byproduct of microbial metabolism. To detect the essential nutrients nitrate, phosphate, and potassium, we use colored test tablets and quantify our results with a custom-built sensor that measures solution opacity. In conjunction with our onboard tests, these results will help us evaluate the sample site's suitability for life.